What's up, guys? So today's uh, podcast is going to be on a smart rule that I think uh, every jiu-jitsu, every smart jiu-jitsu practitioner eventually kind of comes to in their jiu-jitsu, whether they explicitly lay it out this way or not. Um, and it's something that I think is important to keep in mind. The, the earlier, the better. Um, as I'll share, sometimes the going against this, going contradictory towards this idea, towards this rule can lead you down some some bad places with your jiu-jitsu and so again hopefully this is uh this is useful to you as always and uh, hopefully you guys are will be entertained by the stories from a long well it was not that long ago but a, a distant uh jiu-jitsu past mm -hmm. uh, again you know I, i'm starting to feel like this uh as i get older and older i'm starting to feel like one of those old uh old martial arts masters that sits on the the top of the of the of the hill and like talks about this this time that nobody remembers you know what i mean um because i've been doing it longer than most people have even though i'm not that old like i've been doing it for a really long time in comparison to the people that are still doing it now uh -huh. you know yeah. so it's uh it, it's a bit it's a bit sparse to talk to people that have been around since like the early 2000s with training so anyway so we'll get into that in a second and hopefully you guys enjoy it and uh big thanks to our sponsors for helping make this podcast happen so you can listen to my beautiful bearded voice and hear you uh, talk about jiu-jitsu every single week thanks to charlotte's web for helping make the podcast happen guys if you've never tried cbd uh, you guys know if you listen to the podcast i'm a proponent for at least trying it whether or not you continue to use the supplement, that's always upon you. That's what you feel. Uh, but I encourage people to try it because it, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of supplements have, I think we've all been kind of, we've all been burned by a supplement at some sure. point, yeah. or we were told that there was a supplement that was going to make all the difference. And a lot of times when you read about all the effects it has, it just sounds like, like hype and hyperbole, 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 hyperbole. Correct. You got yeah, it. That, that word sounds weird to me. Today perfectly you actually said it correctly and i knew exactly what word you were saying yeah i don't know why that was coming out funny but anyway <laughs> it just sounds overhyped and then you know again when i saw the uh charlotte's web stuff i thought it was kind of the same thing i thought it was just probably oh you know like cb uh, charlotte's web cbd uh, whatever just some stuff that people are hustling now so i wasn't too worried about it eventually i did try cbd um and i tried it because a friend gave me some and i was really impressed with the benefits and then i eventually found more information about it because then i get interested like if i get interested in something i have to go down the rabbit hole like right now um i've for the last couple of months i've been riding horses with my my wife mm -hmm. and so i go down the rabbit hole with horse videos i'm like all right how do i how do i do this and how do i work this particular what what kind of hand grip how should my feet be placed you know just like jujitsu and everything else i'm like i'm going down the rabbit hole because I want to get better at this thing. And I do the same thing with supplements. Anytime I begin to take a supplement, I want to know like, why does it work this way? What is it doing to my body? I want to know all the ins and outs of it. Because again, um, I think that's kind of important what you put in your body, just like food. Why? Like when I was dieting like really hard two years ago and got super lean and everything else, I was like, well, I need to look at like, why is this working so well? Because right now I'm eating tons of carbs and I'm losing lots of weight and I feel great. And I've never looked this good in my life. I'm like, why? Doesn't make sense, right? This doesn't make sense with the like the overall knowledge that's shared about food. So I was like, something must be wrong. And I looked it up and I was like, okay, so actually, if we look at food as just simply fuel, then we have a lot of ways to wiggle with this. Um, and again, I eat really good food. But anyway, getting back to that, I wanted to know why. So I started going and reading books about food. And so I started reading up on Charles Webb and CB, uh, CBD to see why it works the way it does. And uh, again, I started using it, found a lot of good beneficial effects. It can be used for a lot of different reasons, depending on you as a person. Um, you know, some people seem to enjoy it having for sleep, like you can take it at nighttime as part of, you know, your sort of sleep routine. And a lot of people seem to notice a benefit there. Some people notice a benefit if they take it early in the day, maybe kind of chills them out a little bit, mm -hmm. kind of makes them a little bit more even kill. Um, you know, and then there's a lot of different things. I talked to some people who said they felt like they liked it during the uh, the middle of the day when they were doing work. And again, you can figure out what what works best for you, but I encourage you, if you've never tried it before, try it out. And if you have tried CBD before, consider using Charlotte's Web if you don't already use it. It's a, it's a really good, amazing company that does really good quality work and they quality test everything. Everything basically goes through the ringer to make sure that whatever you have in that bottle, that pack of gummies or whatever is what it says it is. Um, when eventually this stuff gets regulated by the FDA, a lot of CBD companies are going to go belly up because their practices of what they put in the bottle aren't so good. So um, anyway, 
With that said, if you guys want to check them out, go to charlottesweb.com. Promo code is jujitsu20 for 20% off the order. Um, and just again, try out a tincture, try out a pack of gummies and see what it does for you. Also, if you guys have never been to epicrollbjj.com, or if you have, either way, I encourage you to check it out again. Check it out for the first time, whatever, and see if there's anything on the, his uh, on Matt's website that uh, that you like. Again, Matt's been a sponsor of the podcast for a couple of years, gotten to know him a little bit. He's become a friend, and he makes some really cool stuff. He makes good rash guards and shorts. Uh, the gis are good. Uh, the t-shirts and the apparel that he makes is, is it's high quality. I like the designs. And so I love encouraging people to check it out and see what they think for themselves. Again, um, I'm one of those people. If you notice everything I say is like, you check it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's more of like, I'm not going to tell you to do anything. I'm like, why don't you try this? It's just like I teach jujitsu. Like we'll talk about this kind of getting into it in just a minute. This is the same way I teach jujitsu where I'm like, I'm not going to tell you this or that. I'm going to say, why don't you try it? And you go see what you think, you know what I mean? Because again, everybody has their own sort of ideas, their own experience to be had. And so again, you know, what I think is really cool as far as the design wise, you may not agree. Um, but that said, the the clothing and the apparel that he makes is high quality. And I like the designs that he makes. He makes them all himself. And he is a jujitsu practitioner, a black belt who is, you know, trains, he rolls. He's one of us and he makes stuff for us which again, that may not seem important to you. That's important to me because again, there's a lot of people that as jujitsu grows, you will see these companies making stuff. Like there was some like, like a hole that was essentially made a sort of version of my logo, mm -hmm. my like a version of jujitsu was like selling it online. Yeah. And people were sending in me money or sending not money, but sending me uh, messages saying, Hey man, this guy's taking your money, man. He's posting this up, whatever. But what was funny about this was that this guy was somewhere in like, you know, some other country, you know, that was selling this stuff, but people were in the comments, like ragging this dude, like you thief, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like, so like, I don't need to worry about it. You guys are doing the work for me. But again, with that said, as the, the martial art grows and the sport grows, you're going to have people that are basically just trying to make a buck. And so again, he's trying to make money just like the rest of us are right. But I think he does a good service for the jujitsu community. He helps out some of the other guys, like create their gear and stuff like that and help them out. And so again, he does a lot of cool stuff with his products and he makes good products. And so I encourage you to check him out. EpicRollBJJ.com is the website. Jujitsu is the code, you know, C-H-E-W-J-I-T-S-U. 15% off is what you get. Um, check it out. And guys, if you want to step up your grooming game, especially if you're a man, although my wife has used the trimmer a bit. Mm. She used the trimmer a little bit, but uh, because it's waterproof, just get, yeah, just get in there, whatever, get in there, get in there, shower up a little bit. But <laughs> if you guys want to step up your your man, your manly grooming routine, I encourage you to check out manscaped.com again. Just like you guys, I have to, you know, I'm, I'm whenever someone sends me stuff, I'm always skeptical. I'm like, eh, I don't know about this stuff because everybody's got something to sell, and in a lot of cases, the stuff that they sell isn't worth buying. You know, it, just the way it is. Like, I mean, I've, 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 I've tried lots of products. Don't always like them. And uh, happens all the time. And so, again, when Manscaped sent their stuff to us, I was like, let's see what they do. Went and tried. They, they sent us two kits, one for Eugene, one for me. We used them, came back. Like, what do you think about it? I was like, I like it. Um, I like everything down to the actual products themselves. The trimmers, the, the razors, everything else, the colognes, the sh shampoos, the soaps all the way up to the actual packaging that it comes into, mm -hmm. um, which again is, is a small thing, but I think uh, it, it improves the overall experience. Like if you get like a, if you get like an Apple, like Apple goes really big yeah, in their packaging. Yeah. If you open up an iPhone, the it's friction, like, it, it's this yeah. part of this, this whole thing. I remember reading about that. Like um, Steve Jobs was talking about making sure that when yeah. you opened it, you had a certain amount of like pull and everything else to, to give it this feel, this tactile yeah. feel. And so when you open up their packages, there's like, a, like there's, it's really, it feels premium is kind of the idea, yeah, right? Yeah. You're not, it's not a crappy trimmer. It's not a crappy bar of soap or whatever. It's not like you're not getting junk. And so again, it's, it's a premium product for sure, uh, but it's high quality. And I really like the smell of the stuff. And again, it's, I've been using my trimmer for over two years now. Um, I've got, I've got two of them and we use mainly the first one just because yeah. it works. I don't need to use the second one, but if you have not tried any of their stuff, I encourage you to go to their website. If you're a guy and you want to step up your grooming game, or if you're a woman and your guy maybe needs to step up his grooming game, you know, maybe he needs to trim his beard a little bit more, trim some other areas a little bit more, then go to manscaped.com 
And then when you go there, check out, see if there's anything you're interested in. And whatever you buy, if you want 20% off and free shipping with it, put in the promo code CHUJITSU, so C-H-E-W-J-I-T-S-U, number 20. That'll give you 20% off and free shipping at checkout. So check them out at manscaped.com. Also, if you guys would like to support the podcast directly, you can do so by going to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Jiu Jitsu podcast. Uh, upon joining, you'll get access to the exclusive content that we have in the back end, which basically stems from every episode that we've done, every guest we've had. There's always something in there. Um, and then again, upon joining, you'll get to access to two free things. You'll get access to a uh, seminar that Eugene did going over mobility and like basically stretching specifically for jiu-jitsu practitioners to help address the muscular imbalances that we have. And again, that's really useful. It's, it's a 20 minute long routine. You could probably join, get that routine and quit if you wanted to and still get your value and still like basically would have paid for the price of admission. Um, because again, like if you take, if you literally took 20, just think about this. This is the way I think about things. I, I posted a video the other day, um, when I was on Andy Stump's podcast and I talked about how, like anything that I do, I basically have to make it into a routine that I do every day slash almost every day. Yeah. Because that's momentum. That's how you get things done. And I think a lot of times people overest like they, they underestimate the importance of the small little things that they do. Right. Um, you know, for instance, there's all these little things that I do for like, let's just go to like my, the businesses. Like I just posted a picture today on Instagram of like, we had, um, of two pictures. One picture was back from 2012. Mm -hmm. It's like 50 people in the mat. I was, was huge. It was, was huge back then. The heck yeah. Now posted the picture from a few weeks ago, hundred plus. And a lot of the people that were in those lines are now out there in the black belt line and their walls, their faces up on the wall and their black belt wall. Now, how did that happen? Did I do it? Was, it wasn't just one big thing. It was these little small daily things that I've been doing for 10 plus years. Yeah. And that's where the magic is. It's like, you know, again, we, we, we just like jujitsu, it's a lot of small movements that then work together in concert to make something better, to make something quote advanced or whatever. Yeah. And so things like, hey, well, how would you feel if you took 20 minutes today and every single day for the next six months and focused on stretching certain tight parts of your body that need need a little attention? How would that help you? I guarantee you'd probably feel like a different person as far as your body goes. And so why don't you? That's that's up to you. Um, but also upon receiving the uh, bonus warm up, you'll also have a access to a seminar that I did that was originally 80 to 100 bucks to join. I think it was, I can't even remember, several years ago. But if you wanted to get the recording, it was like 80 to 100 bucks to get. And again, this goes into gi and no gi techniques that I specifically used in competition that worked really well for me. You get access to both of those for joining. You can get all of that at the patreon.com slash the jujitsu podcast. And at last, guys, if you'd like to join my email newsletter to get my daily email along with exclusive offers I don't share anywhere else and just basically an inside look to whatever's going on in my neck of the woods um, slash just my noggin because there's all kinds of just interesting stuff for training, check out the email list by joining at jujitsu.net slash join J O I N. When you join, you'll get my daily email that I send out and you'll also get access to three free eBooks that go into de designing your own jujitsu game plan, as well as things like drilling and basically how to drill and some different styles of drilling, whether or not you have lots of open mat time or you don't have any. So again, check that out at that website at jujitsu.net slash join. And uh, guys, with that said, let's jump into the podcast. All right, guys. So today's podcast is about a sort of an idea that um, I was thinking about, which is super important. Um, you could consider it a rule for jujitsu, which is essentially don't draw a line in the sand with a technique, um, whether or not it's going to be good or bad or wrong or right or effective or not. And uh, the reason why I say this is because I've seen people go against this rule numerous times in jujitsu to their detriment. And um, I figured I'd share a couple ideas with you guys from that. And then, uh, you know, you just kind of keep this in mind with your training. And obviously you could, this could rule could apply to other aspects of life as well. But I remember the, um, the guillotine choke back when I first started jujitsu, the guillotine choke, when I first started was considered a low percentage technique. Um, it wasn't considered a high percentage technique. It was actually considered pretty low. Most of the time when it was taught, it was kind of taught as, 
hey, if you go against like some big dumb wrestler MMA person that just charges them with their head there, choke them. That was it. There really wasn't a lot more to it. And a lot of times when you would watch the guillotine choke applied back in the early 2000s, you would watch people like just crank on the neck and their head would pop out. I even remember talking to uh, some like old school black belts who said there was like the technique that pissed them off the most was a guillotine choke because mm. nobody really knew how to finish it properly. So all you were do is wrenching on someone's neck and you know, there is a lot of there there's a lot of damage that can be done during that like yes it hurts and it's not necessarily choking you out and you can potentially eat it but if you keep having to eat chokes like that like poorly applied guillotine chokes you're eventually going to run into neck damage you're going to run into your like the neck the c-spine and stuff being just damaged you're going to start having a lot of neck issues with your muscles and everything else it's a problem um and so a lot of old black belts i remember like that was the move where if someone put that on them they would turn it up. I remember talking to Laborio um, at the origin camp and he said that when he was a young guy, you know, and he, um, you know, you, if you train for long enough, you'll have, you'll, your neck gets kind of stiff sometimes. Sure. And he said, man, if someone got me in a guillotine choke and they started wrenching on my neck, he was like, I would go from like nice Laborio to like, I'm going to kill you because nobody, nobody like, I, he's like, I don't, I don't mind being choked out, but I don't want to leave and not be able to train the next day and then have my neck all jacked up because you're trying yeah. to rip my face off. Now, that said, I remember my coach back in the early 2000s when I started back in 2003 would talk about that. Like, man, you know, you don't you don't go for guillotine chokes. It's just kind of a low percentage move, that kind of thing. And, you know, so nobody really did it. We were just it's a low percentage move. Now, you know, we know that that's not true because along the way in the mid 2000s, then you started having people like Marcelo Garcia started like for as an example, he wasn't the only one, but he's one, mm -hmm. right? Who started using that high elbow variation, really getting that torque on the body and sort of what I would call rocking the baby or a sort of um, I call it like sometimes a pirate arm where your arm goes yeah. up like that. And then all of a sudden it's like, man, he's hitting high level guys with that. Um, there were even MMA fighters that all of a sudden, like Joe Stevenson, who started using really good guillotine chokes, and they became became known for it. And it's like, well, I thought this was a low percentage submission. Well, yeah. not any, not anymore. And uh, so then, I remember him begrudgingly sort of rescinding back from his statement. And then another example of this, that I think many people are familiar with. If you're newer to jujitsu, maybe not, but people like in my generation, um, we are familiar with this leg locks used to be considered very low percentage to techniques. They were considered not to have control. They were considered to be sort of like a thing where you got to sit back and you got to really rip it. So they weren't considered safe. Mm -hmm. And from a fighting aspect, they were considered to be very dangerous because you would be putting yourself in a bad spot. Um, and a lot of times they would cite examples such as like Frank Muir versus Ian Freeman. If you go back and watch that fight, Frank Muir was trying to attack the leg and Ian Freeman is just battering him in the face. And Ian Freeman won that fight. This was when Frank Muir was, Frank Muir was very young and was like up and coming. And so, you know, we're watching this and we're like, okay, see, leg locks are whatever. Well, then again, people came along and changed that. I remember there was a big uh, leg lock sort of, you would consider like a renaissance, if you will, uh, during the 2010s, like 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. You started seeing people like uh, uh, Tokino, you know, he, he came into MMA and was just this little fire plug that would heel hook everybody. And nobody had an answer until he ran into Alan Belcher and he was submitting yeah. people left and right with heel hooks. And he was very good at that. And this was an MMA again. And then in, you know, jujitsu, you saw guys like Dean Lister um, and a few others become very proficient with the leg locks. Dean was always good at leg locks, but he was kind of seen as an anomaly, right? It was like, Oh, Dean's good at leg locks. He's good at them. But like everybody else just kind of like kept doing their thing. Yeah. But then in 2011, it was like Dean and several other guys were all attacking with legs. And it was like, okay, maybe there's something here. A few years. And then it only continued from there. And so again, then you started seeing where a lot of these older school black belts, again, who made these hardcore claims on leg locks, they either had to track back and say okay maybe we were wrong about these mm -hmm. or they had to be like an ostrich with its head in the sand and say no 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 leg locks still don't work or something you know and this was uh this is this is just kind of an idea and so it's a really smart idea with techniques to never write them off or put all your trust in them right again always allow there to be wiggle room 
You know what I mean? You don't want to be dependent upon one submission or one technique, but at the same time, you don't want to write off anything because a lot of times a low percentage technique or a position or something, let's go back another one. Here's one more example for you guys, jujitsu history uh, lessons, right? So the half guard back in the day used to be considered half past. If you go back and look at the, the way that a lot of older school jiu-jitsu black belts used to look at it prior to like the 80s and stuff like that, yep. um, late 80s, it was always considered like this really bad position. It was like all you were supposed to do from half guard was get back to full guard. That was its focus, right? And then there's a famous story where a guy like uh, where a guy named Gordo, um, Herberto Correa, Correa, I think is how you say it. He was in a motorcycle accident, as legend has it, tore up his knee, couldn't play full locked guard because it hurt his knee, started playing half guard. That's all he could really play. He wanted to train. All of a sudden, he's developing sweeps from the position. Now, mm -hmm. I'm sure he wasn't the only one doing that at this time. Um, but he started developing that position and became very well known for it. And then all of a sudden half guard then became an offensive position. Um, it's still a half guard is one of these positions where it can be just depending on a very few factors, such as an underhook, um, knee position, whether or not the person's on the side or on their back can become an excellent passing platform for the person mm -hmm. on top, or it can become a really good sweeping platform for the person on the bottom. It just really depends on a few factors, but all of a sudden he becomes really effective with half guard. So this position that had been sort of like locked into it's only good for X, Y, Z is now all of a sudden like, oh, we can use this to be offensive now. It's not just a defensive position anymore. Yep. And so I share that because, again, I, there's more stories that we could go down the list with this kind of thing. But you don't want to write off submissions. You want to keep an open mind and you don't want to draw a line in the sand about it. And, and again, I think this is pr this is a useful lesson off the mats as well. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not I'm not a life coach, so I'm not going to get into that kind of stuff. Um, but even off the mat, I've had ideas where, again, you know, I think it was someone that said like, like maturity, right? Like a sign of maturity is being able to entertain ideas that maybe contradict your own. You know what I mean? Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but that you can at least like try to look at them. And so, like, for instance, like, even if you think a submission or a technique is not a good idea or it's this, that, or whatever, it's like, you, you know, be intelligent and mature enough to like, well, let's see, let's entertain this a little bit because I've, you know, again, a lot of people unfortunately get locked into their, their ideas. They get locked into their stuff that they do and it ends up becoming, that's their thing. And for them to learn new stuff becomes really problematic i think it was emerson that said that a lot of times as our lives go on the stuff that and again i'm paraphrasing here but the stuff that's given us the most success the stuff that's helped us out the most oftentimes is the stuff that in the end kind of lames us where basically like we become so dependent upon it it becomes a crutch rather than a help whereas the stuff that ends up being the most problematic for us a lot of times on the other end makes us better you know what I mean? And so a lot of times we become so like clingy to like one thing that we do or in jiu-jitsu or our position or our technique or whatever, that then all of a sudden, like trying to learn something new and put ourselves back to being like a lower level person, essentially, that's problematic and it's hard to do. And again, the people that are willing to do that, they're willing to put themselves down there. Um, they typically tend to become better and better as time goes on. And the people that don't continue to learn, they don't continue to challenge, develop new things with new techniques, they tend to be left behind over time. And um, and so again, you know, low percentage techniques, low percentage submissions, positions, whatever, those low percentage moves a lot of times can become high percentage moves with just some simple adjustments and the right practitioner to be wielding them. Um, again, it's like you, you put me in a race car and put a professional driver in a race car, same car. They're going to be able to know how to use that car in a different way than I can. And like that with jujitsu, you know, a technique is a technique, but the, the practitioner that wields it and the skill of that practitioner that wields mm -hmm. it and their ability to experiment and be open-minded enough to try different things, Th that kind of thing that's what separates it you know again techniques are just a tool and the practitioner wielding it is what really determines the effectiveness of that tool yeah we're, we're we're creatures of habit i mean that's really it like we're we're comfortable in our box right that's where we feel good that's where we know what's going on that's where we have more control right when it 
can, comes to things that we're not necessarily as knowledgeable of or hasn't been effective for us, we may, you know, we try to discard it. But I think as far as jujitsu goes, um, some of those techniques are probably dependent on necessity, on body position, on what you're able to do. You know, if you're someone that ends up on your back a lot, maybe you don't have great takedowns, right? You end up on your back. Well, that guillotine might be a very good position. And it's not just a, uh, it's not just a submission because you can use it to reverse positions, mm -hmm. to sweep, to, you know, there's a lot to it. Like, I think, you know, drawing that, like you said, like that line in the sand, it makes you comfortable because it gives you almost like these concrete rules, right? You're like, oh, I know this works, this doesn't. Mm -hmm. And going out into the fringe where things are kind of iffy, that's that's not very comfortable because as a coach, especially, you want to say, yeah, I know this and this. It, it's kind of hard to be like, well, you know, some coaches are great at that, you know, admitting they're wrong. Some coaches are not, mm -hmm. you know, some coaches are very much set in their ways. And like, I'm the authority figure and I know this is what works and it can make it, it can stagnate your jujitsu or even the, the growth of your gym. Yeah. So, you know, you think about this, you say creatures of habit. Um, I like to think of it sometimes as creatures of self-esteem. So, be, yeah, yeah. Well, we are like, <laughs> I mean, no, no, you think about this humans, like think about what we are really doing in a lot of cases, right? Like when we like in almost every space, humans are trying to climb some sort of ladder, right? C trying to climb a ladder so they can, um, you know, get um, basically boost their, their basically view of themselves. Yeah. Right. And we're all, we all do this, right? Like may, maybe you get more nice stuff. Cause you're going to, Hey, look at my house. Look at my car. I got, I got a lot of cool stuff. Look how cool I am. Or I got a promotion at work or look at my metal that I've got. That means I'm worth something. Um, you know, all these different things that it's to build up our confidence. Um, it's to build up who we like our view of ourselves within our, our society. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, by the way, because I think it would be better to do that, like to go through the to go through the channels that we have, the productive channels of society that we have yep. to basically prove yourself to society, to become worthy of, of being a, being a, you know, good productive citizen that is beneficial to those around you than just basically shirking off the whole system. And then being like, I don't like this anymore. And then you get your own sort of self-esteem through other means through like, maybe, um, you see this a lot in society today with people like where they like want to just, they don't like the whole system. So therefore they're, they, they're just not going to play the game and instead they're just going to say it sucks and it's bad. And we need to tear it down. Yeah. Um, but that sometimes in, in my view would be kind of a dangerous thing because, um, you look at the other systems in place. They're not always, uh, our system could be improved. The game could be improved hundred percent. Absolutely. I don't think tearing at all. It's like, maybe we need to change some of the rules. Maybe we need to change some of the, the things that are going on, but we don't want to just like throw the baby out with the bathwater. That said, everybody's out to get self-esteem. Everybody's out trying to boost their, their self-esteem and we all do it. And so think about what happens. If you get really good at something, okay, you get really good at a particular thing, you get known for a particular thing, you, you gain notoriety in a particular place. To now shirk that, to let go of that, that's a hard thing for us to do because we're like, well, because that really comes down to how confident are you really? Because are you basically just is your is the fact that you are a you know guy who makes all this money has this car has this whatever is that simply a crutch that your confidence leans upon and that if that stuff was taken away you really don't have confidence or hey even the fact that like, maybe you know, you're really good at like this jiu jitsu thing right could you go be a beginner at something else and not and just be okay with sucking at something or is your jujitsu, is your, is your, your ego and your idea of yourself so wrapped up in this thing that you lean against that crutch for your confidence? And, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question to ask, right? Like for instance, if you were to talk to me and say, Chewy, let's take away your, your, your YouTube notoriety. Boom. Take it away. Let's take away your gym. Boom. Take it away. Let's take away all your jujitsu medals and all your accomplishments. Boom. What's left. Are you still a confident person in who you are? Who knows? I don't know. You know what I mean? But again, we derive a lot of our, we, we derive a lot of our confidence from these things yeah. and that becomes who we say, okay, I'm confident because of X, Y, and Z. Look at all this stuff that I've done. Look who I am. Look what I've become. I feel confident become, because of these things. And so then to say, I am going to say, 
from here, I'm going to move into an area where I suck. That's hard for people because now you're letting go of that thing that maybe is like the crutch that you lean on for your boost of self-esteem. So imagine someone who in their lives like really leans on jujitsu, really leans on, I'm really good at this thing. And I submit everybody in the gym, yada, 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 so on. If they all of a sudden play a different position, they're getting beat. That's a hard thing for them. Mm -hmm. And they really have to do some soul searching to like figure, like to look at that in the face. And, um, you know, like that's, uh, it's like Jess and I like recently, like Jess was talking to me because we've been doing our horse riding lessons and like, I suck. I'm not good at, oh, and I don't want to say suck. It's I'm not trained enough. I'm not well practiced because it's, it's, it's a skill thing. So, you know, I can play around a little bit, but I'm not good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I enjoy it, but it's fun, but I'm not good at it. And she's like, well, she's like, she was impressed that like, cause she, she wasn't like expecting me to stick with it, but I enjoyed it and I'm having fun with it and I still suck at it, but I'm still trying, you know? And I'm like, have you not watched any of my videos joking with her? Of course. Cause she's watched uh -huh. them. Uh -huh. I was like, I'm not going to give up just because it's difficult. Right. right. I mean, that's fun. Um, but it's one of those things where again, I'm putting myself in a position like on a daily, on a weekly basis where I go to these riding lessons and like, I've got like 12 year olds that are like doing circles around me <laughs> as far as what I can do. Right. And it's yeah. very much like the, the ex athlete from football or who's the CEO of something makes tons of money, drives his, his expensive car to the gym, you know, and then these people come into the gym and they're getting beaten by a 15 year old kid in the gym yeah. who, you know, like has acne and just, you know, just started having his voice drop. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. it's, it's a little difficult at first. And so you've got to be able to be okay with that. And so again, that's a thing that people struggle with is that self-esteem issue. It's like, because again, we derive a lot of our self-esteem based upon the things that we do and our actions not necessarily like, you know, cause it's hard, it's hard to say who, who are we, you know, yeah. you say, who are we? A lot of times we tell stories about who we are. If I ask you, you know, I'm this, that, and the other. And so it's like, those are the things that typically help define our identity. And you've just, it's not a bad thing, but you just got to make sure that you keep it in check so that it doesn't hinder you from again, exploring new realms of abilities. Yeah. I think keeping it in check, uh, it, trying new things, learning new things. The whole learning process is humbling, whether it's a different avenue of your jujitsu game, whether it's a, a new skill altogether has nothing to do with jujitsu. In some ways that you can probably draw parallels, I'm sure. But like learning something new, for example, you know, I've used this uh, numerous times. It's like for me, I did primarily gi. Mm -hmm. I didn't screw around with the legs at all. And then going into class, and going with some of these belts that I can, if I play my game, I could handle, I can do what I need to do. I can win, quote unquote, win the, the role, whatever you want to say, or submit mm -hmm. the, my opponent or my, my training partner. But when I play their game and I enter myself into the leg locks, now I'm at maybe even or a disadvantage against yeah. the lower belt and right. I'll get caught and you're like, shit. But like, I know that. I do this long enough. It, it, I'm going to overcome that hump and it's going to get easier and I'm going to mm -hmm. get better. I'm actually going to enjoy it. I think you have to get, you can't quite be stuck in your ways, uh, especially in, in a sport like jujitsu or martial art, like jujitsu, which is constantly evolving and just evolving at such a rapid pace. You know, every tournament or you like, you know, look at the probably ADCC before, like in 2020 to 2022 or whenever it was, mm -hmm. Like there's probably a lot of things that have changed. You know, you've got people that are new on the scene winning. You know, Giancarlo, we talked to him uh, the other week. He's relatively a new guy to the Nogi scene, and he's mm -hmm. taken out some of these some of these guys that have won a couple ADCCs. Like, what are they doing different, or what are they doing better? And I think you have to always be willing to learn and dive into like a new aspect of your game. You want to hone in on where you're really, really good, mm -hmm. and I think that's where that kind of you know, give and take is you want to still work on what you're good at, but you want to learn new things. And the evolution of, of, of jujitsu is kind of, it's glaring and it's there. And like, if you know, like your game, probably Chewy is changed in the past 10 years immensely. I mean, there's certain avenues and folds in your game that I think are probably significantly better. And then some other new areas that you added in, you know, oh, I yeah. don't know if you had like, like that rolling back take that, that you had that you kind of developed. And I think some of that was coming from, uh, learn maybe Brandon McCatherine and some of the 10th planet ideas that they, that they kind of implement, you know, I, I mean, I don't know, like you, you're searching for, for different avenues to maybe feed into your game and improve your game. Yeah. The, the rolling back take was like, I was doing it. It was, it was actually, 
a double underpass mixed with some wrestling. Yeah. I started getting into that truck position before I really knew it was the truck position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then once I started, I, once I wrote, you know, worked with Brandon McGaffron, there was a few details from the truck that made it even better. Yeah. I was like, ah, okay, cool. So it was like a combination of like, you know, several different systems and styles. You know, one of the things you, we were kind of touching was like doing something new. This is kind of off to the side, but it could be important for coaches. And, you know, people listening to this, even if you're new, there may be a day where you become a coach. One of the things I think is is really helpful is to have as a coach to do something new every so often. It doesn't mean that you have to go like deep into it, but to do something new that's related to skill, some new skill acquisition type thing. And the reason being is, is that as a coach, you can oftentimes, especially if you get pretty good, you can often forget how good you are and how distant you are from beginners. Right. And mm. a lot of times you can forget what you don't know. You can forget how awkward it is to be new at something. Um, you know, one of the first times I had this experience, I remember I was um, I was a black belt and this is back in 2012. And um, I was meeting a woman for a dance lesson. Uh, we went to this. They, they basically we do salsa lessons at this nightclub. And so got there. I literally just got done training, cleaned up and just went to the nightclub, get there. And, um, you know, I'd never done salsa before. And at the time, I just started dating this woman. So, I mean, we weren't even like together together. We're just dating. So I'm like, you know, I want to make a good impression, whatever. So. Sure. I get there and I remember the you know, they're showing the lessons and the, the movements and stuff, which was which was fine. But then there was this moment where there were these two circles, a, a circle in the center and a circle in the outer. The center circle was all men, the outer circle was all women. And basically the way it would work is you would like it would play for about a minute, and then they would like tell you to switch and they would the circles would rotate and you would switch to a new partner. Right. And then you'd have a new partner, you dance with them, and then you would just keep switching. And this way, you're just kind of having, you're getting yeah. used to, to, to shifting and switching to different people. I remember there was a moment where at one point there was an odd number. And sure enough, I'm by myself. There's, <laughs> there's not a woman in front of me. And I remember like with a woman, it was easy because I'm okay. Now I'm, I'm holding her hand and we're moving back and forth with our feet. Now it was like, I'm standing by myself and I feel stupid. You know, and I'm like, I don't, and I'm sitting there like shifting my feet. I feel like, I feel like I'm dumb. And, you know, the, the girl that I was dating who did salsa, she jumped over and filled in the spot with me and started dancing with me. And then it was fine again. But there was a moment where I, for like 20 seconds, I felt so awkward and out of place and not really sure what to do with my hands or yeah. anything. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was like, oh, and I remember it being so enlightening. I was like, oh, this is what white belts feel like when they first come in. They feel so stupid, right? They feel so dumb and they, you know, they just, because they don't know what to do and they can't put their stuff in the right place. And uh, with the horse riding lessons recently, you know, I've started doing those and then like, you know, I'm getting better at it and I can definitely feel like I'm making progress. I remember the first time doing it, like I felt so out of place, bro. I feel off balance. I feel like I'm about to flop off this horse. You know, it's all these things going on at once. And like, you know, it just like jujitsu, there's a lot of, um, very much a lot of it's physical. It's like being conscious of multiple different sectors of your body to do certain things. Like you're supposed to keep your heels down, um, you know, your hands in a certain position and all these different things are happening and you have to keep them in check the whole time. And it's like, once you seem to like get one where it needs to be, then the others are not doing what they're supposed to. And again, it's a reminder of what it's like to be new at something. And so often people can forget and I think it's an important thing for coaches to do something new every every now and then. Now, you don't have to go deep on it. You don't have to spend much time on it. But just doing something new from time to time just to reconnect with like being brand new at something and feeling awkward and stupid is super important because not only does it help improve your ability to teach because yeah. now you're thinking, well, how could I make sure like, you know, whatever, this doesn't happen. But also it reminds you and makes you empathetic to what they're going through so that you don't like like say dumb stuff to them. You know, because again, I, you know, I, I would think that most, most coaches are more empathetic to their students. And I think most are, but I've had enough messages from people online that who feel like their coaches, like their coaches will say like abhorrent things to them. They're brand new. Like it's, what do you expect from them? You know what I mean? And it's, it's strange that as a coach, you know, you would say like things that would be kind of demeaning to this new student rather than saying, Hey, listen, I was there once. 
let me help you out, you know? And again, most coaches I think are that way, but there are some that aren't. Um, and if you feel like at some point you become disconnected from that empathy towards that new person, it's a great time to go do something new to remind yourself that like, Hey, when these people are coming in, they feel just as awkward as you feel doing whatever other activity that you try to do. Yeah. I think that's a great point. I mean, you, you should be like, I think it's a good business model, right? To, to be kind to your, to your potential new students. I mean, you want to, you want them to feel welcome. It's very different. Uh, you know, like we talk about jujitsu, maybe, when you started and somewhat when I started, it wasn't terribly the most welcoming thing. You kind of did jujitsu with the goal of fighting MMA, you know? So that was kind of, you're not doing jujitsu to be a sport practitioner. And it's like, you kind of want the toughest people in the gym. You kind of want your gym to be known as being this tough, hard ass gym. You know, mm -hmm. if you, if you're training with these dudes, you know, you're, you're, you're worth it. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're able to hang. And then now it's like, it's, it, there are a lot of people that aren't in it for most people aren't in it to to train MMA. They're in it to do jujitsu as a self, way of self improvement, learning a martial art, whatever. There are plenty of reasons there. So I think like you know you have to understand the development and the and, the, and that's a change in jujitsu. You know that's you know you would have thought jujitsu was for this thing purpose initially, and now it's for something a little bit different. It does mm -hmm. have avenues. Obviously, it translates to MMA and and self-defense and and whatever but it's also just some it's just purely there for the sport for the fun for the getting in better shape mm -hmm. like and if you're not evolving with that then you're going to miss out on a lot and you're not going to connect with your students you're probably not going to have a successful gym yeah no i mean it depends on what you mean by success right like so making I, instance, money or keeping yeah. your doors open and making a living like because you know for instance i know a guy who has a gym and he has some good competitors um but like he ne he never has any new people come in really stick because they they come in and he, they get chewed up um so he's got some really good athletes and good competitors yeah. but anybody that comes in new they don't stick around um because they they get kind of washed out um you know and for him it's okay because that success is 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 that is success for him is like that's what he wants whereas like me i'm kind of in the middle on this like i want competitors but i like having people that are like like, you know, it, 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 to me, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun exercise in your coaching ability to be like, can I take you as someone who's not athletic that doesn't come ready out of the box with a great set of attributes? Can mm -hmm. I turn you into something, you know? And to me, that's a, that's a fun exercise as a coach and the, in a fun sort of testament to a program. Can you take someone who's not like a, a true athlete and make them into someone that's pretty good at this stuff? Because taking an athlete and making them good at jujitsu is not very difficult. Um, it's it's very it's relatively easy um, to make them decent at jujitsu, right? Um, but taking someone that's not that's a difficult task, mm -hmm. and I think it's a great it's a great exercise in your ability as a coach. Yeah. And so I like I like those regular people coming in because again, it's like let's see what we can do with them and the stuff that you learn from them can they be applied to your athletes that makes them better and you get a really cool culture of people where you get a wide myriad of types of people rather than like one type of person you know what i mean yeah. so i i like having a big a, a sort of a spectrum of students um that can train together everything from like your high level competitors to your hobbyists that train a few times a week yeah and you got that like with um you know, having like a competition team or a higher level, like maybe like blue belt and up or purple belt and up classes versus white belt classes. I think that helps provide that environment. That's, you know, you have a coach that's maybe more focused on the basics being kind of taking it easy versus, you know, you got these higher level athletes or competitors or whoever that need a little bit more of that, maybe vigorous kind of hard nose training, right. Which mm -hmm. isn't supportive of everyone, but I think like that's, that's, a testament to how much jujitsu has grown obviously like that you are have because before in the early you know earlier days you didn't have these separate classes like or you weren't able to really distinguish them in, in a lot of ways it was all like everybody's doing class together and you're just trying to you know toughen them up by by going hard and training hard so i think that's part of just the evolution of the sport and things changing right i mean jujitsu is like it was seen as this the self defense for the little person or the smaller or weaker person. Now yeah, that, was, not, that was the that was the myth. It's not that way. Well, the the myth has kind of been you know you, if you got somebody that's bigger, stronger, but also knows jiu jitsu, you're gonna have a hard time with them. That's where those attributes that were kind of seen as not 
important are very important. You know, strength, athleticism, speed, all that stuff's very important. Mm -hmm. Obviously, skill set can can counter a lot of those things. But yeah, that's just the evolution, and that's just kind of the having an open mind of what jujitsu can become or what it's becoming. And that's the same thing with the techniques of a guillotine or, uh, you know, I was just thinking of some other rules, right. Or some other things, you know, like you mentioned leg locks, right. Mm -hmm. Low percentage kind of taboo seen as dirty kind of, they're not like the, it's not like, Oh, well you've went by leg locks. You're not like, it's almost not, not valued in, in a way you're kind of seen as like the going for the low hanging fruit in some instances. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like when, I, you know, so um, for any ladies that are listening to this, understand that that's where this is coming from, by the way, where I'm getting to. Okay. So when I first started, there were almost no women training. I sure. mean, it's very, yeah. very few. And so, it's, I mean, it's all, it's still fairly like a high percentage of men. Um, but back then it was like, this, it was just basically all men. Yeah. When men are in groups with each other, most men, the way that like if you look at the etymology of our derogatory terms to one another like men are constantly messing with each other we can like any group of men if, if you've been around any men that like groups it's like we cut each other down um constantly and a lot of times that's how you know you're in you know like like <laughs> so backwards right <laughs> yeah it, it is because we're messing with you well because yeah. it like you know it's like for instance like me i'm not going to mess with someone if I don't like that person because it's because it's real, right? Like I'll mess with you because I really like you as a person. It's fun. And then, you know, you, you'll, you'll say stuff back to me and it's fun because we really don't mean it. You know, we're, we're making, we're cracking jokes on each other. If I actually don't like you, I'm just not going to talk to you because I don't like you. And because if I say something mean and derogatory, it comes from a place of being too real and it would not come across as funny. It would be like, ooh, this one's uh, Chewy's being an asshole, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just not going to. Yeah. Um, and so when we like, when we were in groups together and we become bonded, we, we cut each other down. And, and a lot of times I remember being early on, the way that we would talk about people that went for leg locks or when you did leg locks in the gym, if you won with a competition, sometimes they'd be okay with it. Um, although there was a famous match with Comprito where he won the worlds, the Mundials with a toehold and he had garbage thrown on him um, from the crowd. But back then, the way that we would talk about it is that it was almost as um, a lot of our terms from the way that men cut down on each other in, in society is a lot of times is a, uh, it's like, basically feminine stuff right we like say mm -hmm. if you really think about like there's a really good book by a guy named john mccorder mm -hmm. who's a, he's a linguist and he um talks about these different dirty words or bad words in our uh, our language and he gets into like the bad words that men use against other men and a lot of times it's, everything goes back to like challenging your masculinity right that's really mm -hmm. what it comes down to uh that's where if you think about all the terms like you know like like we'll say like you know that's why you'll say like, oh, don't put a go like put your dress on or don't put your dress on or something like that or put your big boy boots on or something, you know, challenging our masculinity. And so like back in the day, it was like that with leg locks. If you did a leg lock, it's like, oh, you're not man enough to pass the guard and go to the, like a uh, arm bar mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. or take the back and choke them. It's like you had to be you had to be a bitch and go for the the to the, the leg lock. Psh, sure, sure. Whatever. That's that's the way that we looked at it. Yeah. back then and that's the way that it was kind of expressed and so even if there wasn't like a rule because i remember where i trained we didn't really have a rule that said you couldn't go for leg locks because sometimes we'd mess around with them it was just one of those things where it was like oh you're not a real man you can't mm. go for the upper body submissions it's um it's almost like in chess i remember reading about like a uh, chess theory like i think it was in the sometime in the 1800s there was a particular time where their uh like gambits and stuff were really popular where basically you would you would give up pieces to win uh -huh. there's a there's a famous match uh, with a guy was a paul like mooney um i think is his name I'm, I'm probably remembering that incorrectly i'm gonna look it up real quick um right. paul morphy sorry morphy that was the name i was like i knew it was something weird. paul morphy he has a famous chess game right where basically he just it's it's so wild to watch it like you can actually watch like a a, a clip of people moving the pieces in mm -hmm. the the space that it was or in, in, the, in the 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 in the action in which those things happened, he basically gives up all his pieces and ends up checkmating the guy. It's, it's so wild to watch. But, um, <laughs> but, but the thing was, it was interesting is like, 
back then I remember reading about it and it was almost like these guys are playing and like if they give a piece to exchange and you don't take it, it's like, oh, you're not a real man. You don't want to exchange a piece. You don't want to, you know, uh-huh. you don't want to do that whole thing. And it was kind of interesting to read that um because you're like okay like you know so this this is not just jiu-jitsu this is just there becomes these norms that we agree upon where it's yeah. like oh this is what we do and if you don't do this you're not a real man it's the rules of engagement i guess in some ways right like Pretty rules much. of war or rules of combat but right it, it's like for instance like the way and you know maybe this is rightly so like for instance if 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 let's say if like two fights happen one fight involves a guy coming up to him saying hey man da 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 let's fight and they put their hands up and they duke it out with each other right versus the guy comes up and sucker punch him we would look negatively against the guy that sucker punched him because it's like he was cowardly right whereas we would look at the other one and say well he you know maybe he shouldn't have been fighting but you know at least he faced the guy face to face and basically gave him adequate time to prepare himself so that then the engagement could happen rather than being cowardly and you know sure. that kind of thing with it and so um you know you could maybe even say it's like that we saw leg locks as being almost cowardly because mm-hmm. we didn't want to engage in the uh the the upper body fight the guard passing upper body fight the honorable honorable way of doing jujitsu right right but that's kind of one of those it's like um you you're a military guy or not military but you you do a lot about history and military and things yeah and so like think of like how they the war used to be how battles used to be fought right everybody lines up and they have like a and they shoot each at each other right in lines like they shoot at each other versus when they started kind of sneaking around like doing more like not just standing in front of each other and firing it was more like you know deceptive and kind of sneaking out and and just different you probably know better than i do but that was kind of seen as the honorable way to do battle right you stand in the west each other in the west yeah okay in the west so it's so like like there's there's this idea that like for instance when you look at like like war ideas and theories like it started with the greeks where it's like okay we're gonna line up in this this agreed upon battlefield yeah and we're just gonna duke it out and we're gonna have a battle with each other and You know, that sort of idea prevailed for a long time in the West where it was like, okay, here's the battlefield. Now we're going to fight. You would have guerrilla fighting from time to time. But there was this very much in the West. um, You know, when I say the West, I mean, like, you know, the the Western world and Europe, things like that. Yeah. um, Where, you know, you would do that kind of thing. Right. That if you look at the East, the their idea on deception is nothing like ours. Um, you know, this can be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. But basically, yeah. they, they have no qualms with this. And you look at their battles, and they're very different than ours in some cases. They would still have these big battles and stuff like that. But this idea of this, like, we're going to sit toe-to-toe with each other and have, like, a just duke it out battle, it's very much just a sort of a Western concept mm-hmm. that that was, like, um, became this thing where that's the way that we want to do it. And you can see yeah. that where a lot of times that gets us into trouble with other countries because we expect people to fight like that. And a lot of times they don't, right? Because they don't fight straight face to face. They're going to fight in more deceptive ways or more in ways to sort of like break it down instead of like attacking you this way. It's going to be a different way that isn't going to be what we would consider honorable or, um, you know, the, the way to do it. And so it's very common. And so, but th- that's something that happens. So you're right. So you're talking about like with the shooting, you're talking like, say like, the Napoleonic era where you would have literally guys line up in lines with guns and to shoot at each mm-hmm. other. And it's, this, it's basically a chess match where you're, you have your infantry cavalry and artillery and you're playing around with them in different ways. And then later on, they had to be like, in say like world war one, when that started, you get into a situation where now you have rifle barreled guns, you have repeat, like, like basically like ma- machine guns that can fire so fast. So those old tactics couldn't work anywhere. You couldn't just walk out into the field, um, and just charge because people would be mowed down. And so they had to start developing um, basically some of the same battle tactics that are used today with fire teams where people would be in small groups and they would use like different tactics to get in and get out. And um, yeah. still, you're you're still very much fighting a, you're on this team, we're on that team, and we're still battling on a front line. But there is some, you know, there's different ways of, of those battle tactics opposed to saying like, you know, we are going to maybe um use children in front of us to guard us so that that you won't shoot on us or we're going to you know just wear civilian clothes and then we're going to pop off a couple shots and then run away into a group of civilians we're we're still in our we're still in our uniforms so again there's just uh there's different ideas on the rules of engagement what people consider the way to do them and again they're they're ideas from us as humans um and they change from group to group yeah 
what what just happened that I'm bringing up history and then the I don't know, bro. Battles and you. What have you done to me, man? Well, and I don't. I was know, the one to bring that up. <laughs> well, and also I'm getting like I just like so I just lifted and I did lift. I lifted and did jujitsu this morning, uh-huh. and then um, I uh, I just had my cup of coffee for the day. Yeah, yeah. and so my brain just started it's like starting to ramp up. Well, I always tell people I'm like, if you drink your 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 cup of coffee in the morning, like first thing. Like if you work, if I, I like to work out in the morning first thing, cause if I work out early in the morning, a lift or work out, I always, I sleep so much better at night when I do that. Cause I'm just, I, I'm tired, you know? Yeah. And, um, if I have coffee after my first training session, I feel amazing. I don't crash off of it or anything. And so like, but and when it hits, like the caffeine hits a little differently after you've kind of <laughs> worked out and everything else, it just, it just does, man. It's like, yeah, yeah. uh, I told Jess, I'm like, I call it earned coffee. And so whenever I get done training and have that cup, that cup of coffee for the day, I'm like, like brain, reward, just, man. brain just going, you know what I mean? Yeah. So awesome. Well, cool. A chewy, a couple other ideas um, okay. that I was thinking, you know, leg locks, cross training was another one. Yeah. Cross training um, was a big one. Uh, let me see what else I wrote down. Um, even training other martial arts like judo possibly. I feel like there may have been like, you know, you're like jujitsu is better than this. You know, you yeah. think of like the UFC in the early days, like style versus style. Right. You had karate guys and this and that. And, but now, you know, mixed martial arts, MMA is, is all these styles combined, taking the best out of each one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and again, you have people that are extremely good at certain positions or they'll pull guard, which is not yeah. the best idea, but some people will pull guard. Um, I don't know if you saw the Makachev and Oliveira uh, fight. I haven't seen it. No. So he actually pulled guard or, or sat back and, and Charles, Charles Oliveira, Charles Oliveira didn't. He did that. I think um, to actually create a scramble. So he, and he almost got to the back at one instance. I don't uh. re- recall the exact, Situ the exact uh how it played out, but he pulled guard and he was working some positions. They actually, I think he was doing that to come out to the back. Who won and, the fight? Uh, Ma- Makachev won okay. and he submitted him. Ooh. He basically dropped him in the second round mm. and then ca- and got into half and passed and got an arm triangle. Okay, and, and and tapped him. I mean, he was very dominant. Um, it, it, he was it, Oliver was getting kind of smacked around a little bit he was he got dropped over got dropped in the first round then again the second he finished it. But i mean i feel like older, cool. he always gets hit he does and and he wasn't hurt that bad he kind of you know he wanted to be on his back but i think market has got such a good base yeah. such a good base and i mean he looked so good so dominant which is cool but he did pull guard initially and then like he was trying to basically get to the back and he almost got to the back uh but but market got him off and then just stayed on top of him and you know, but that was an interesting strategy. I remember watching Lovato like pull half guard or something mm-hmm. to sweep and came up, you know, pulled half guard and then came up and, and, and swept the guy and got on top. Um, because I think he may have had a hard time taking him down. So mm-hmm. very interesting. You know, how some of these people will use jujitsu in, in in ways that we'll see in obviously a jujitsu match, but not in an MMA format. So yeah, I mean, you know, it, it goes back to one of the ideas we've shared before in the podcast, which is you want to be sort of a technical mercenary. Yeah. You know, you don't want to get locked into, I have to do it this way or that way or whatever. You want to be able to just just take techniques from wherever you get them. You know, whether it's from another martial art, another coach, another whatever, it doesn't matter. Technical mercenary, bring it all in. And you don't want to be locked into anyone's dogma. Um, a lot of times, like the way that I think about it, again, I've shared this quote numerous times, but it's such a good one you will spend a lot of time in your jujitsu, like listening to other people's rules, mastering other people's systems. Yeah. And it's not, it, this is the right thing to do. Like a lot of times people want to jump the gun and they want to like, okay, I want to develop my own style, my own system, whatever. Hold your horses. You've been training for two years, like not long enough. You'll find techniques and you'll find your own variations over time. Yes. But you want to master, like if you've got someone that is a is a whiz or master at something, you want to do it like them as to the best of your ability. And then it's only after that that you can really find some really cool stuff on the other end that will make it uniquely yours. Yeah. Um, there was a really cool book that I, I or a cool lecture series that I listened to some years ago. And I remember the person was talking about like what they observed with people that basically did uh, when they observed like studies on motor pattern learning, you know, movements, yeah. movement pattern learning. Mm-hmm. If you guys aren't familiar with motor pattern, I mean, we are, but if you're not familiar, if you're listening. So what they observed with people that were, were like learning movements and they found that it started off in, a th- in three ways. Essentially, it would start off with variation. 
if they show a class how, or a group or whatever, how to do a thing, mm -hmm. there's always going to be variation because everybody's messing it up in different ways, yep. right? So it's all over the place. If people stick with it long enough, it then becomes uniform. Yep. Everybody is doing it the way that it's been shown and taught and everybody is doing it a very particular way. Now, it's at this point where if someone then took it to another level and continued to train with that particular movement, that then there would be variation again. And the variation would yep. be based upon how they change it. But it's that, but it has to go through the uniformity step. And yeah. so you have to like spend time mastering stuff and then you go on the other end. And this goes to that quote that I've shared numerous times, which uh, comes from um, um, Ma master the music, master the, you. Ma and I want, I, I'm always, I'm having trouble with names today. Um, <laughs> I will right, we'll wrap it up. This will be the last quote. We'll send them. Hold on one sec. Give me just, a sec. I gotta, right, I gotta get right. the guy's name. So in case you ever want to uh, do it, um, bring it up here but basically it's you master the music you master the instrument charlie parker you master the instrument you master the music or you master the instrument master the music and then you forget all that shit and you just play right. and basically this was talking about jazz which a lot of jazz is very much impro improvisation and when you look at that sort of sequence it's the same thing that they observed in these studies you start studying right so that you can make everything uniform and you can master what the masters have figured out and you start to learn this stuff on such a deep intuitive level whether you can explicitly explain it or not you learn it and then what happens is that then allows you to then improvise and create something brand new because it's no longer knowledge in the sense that you have to know it and explicitly talk about it. It's so ingrained in your being that, you know, you are jujitsu. Jujitsu is you. You're so wired for it. Your body's wired for it. Your body has literally, your body will begin to have muscular imbalances that have literally deformed your body in a way that yes, make sir. it more that make it more efficient for jujitsu, right? Um, every sport that you do is going to deform your body in a way that give you advantages in that sport. Right. Yep. And so you're literally changing on a physiological level, a neurological level as you're training for a long time. And then eventually all these things get sort of wired into your system. And so it's no longer like you thinking about just as a separate thing. It's literally like wired into your being. And it's at that point where all of a sudden there's this creative explosion. And I think that that's why it doesn't necessarily happen just at black belt, but why a lot of people say that when you get to black belt, that's when it really starts over again. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at black belt, but basically once you've mastered at least a chunk of jujitsu and you've really gotten good at it and you've really developed yourself in it, there comes a point where you now start to become incredibly creative because you're not, really thinking about it things are just happening and a lot of times you have to even like the other day i did a, a technique i've never seen it before it just happened and i had to backtrack what did i just do my body did something that i then didn't even realize i was doing it like with my thought and i had to go back and say like i grabbed my partners like come here real quick i gotta figure out what i just did because that was pretty cool yeah and i figured it out you know but it's um it's like that and so again and once you get to that level which takes some years of course but once you get to that level that's when all of a sudden and going back to our idea with these low percentage techniques and stuff like that, you can take a technique that might be quote low percentage and all of a sudden you can give it new life because you have such a deep knowledge of jujitsu and you can start playing around with different variations and trying different stuff and all of a sudden, boom, you can take something that was quote low percentage and make it high percentage. All right, guys. So hope you enjoyed that podcast. Hopefully you got something from it. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, our, uh, our little early afternoon rant, especially with my uh, coffee buzz going. That's right. Start talking super fast. I'm sure I know some of you guys that are in other countries that sometimes maybe English isn't your first language. I apologize. I know sometimes I get speaking fast when I get excited. Um, but hopefully you guys enjoyed the podcast nonetheless and got some ideas to chew on that could make your jiu-jitsu better. Um, just want to give a big shout out to our sponsors for helping make the podcast happen so that we can actually come to you every week and talk to you and share the podcast with you. Um, Charles Webb. You guys, if you've listened to the podcast, you're very familiar with them. Um, again, they're a great sponsor. They uh, they make a fantastic product. They make a really top quality CBD product. Um, if you're someone that uses CBD already or you've never tried CBD, I encourage you to try Charlotte Swift's products if you've never used them before. Again, they make a really top-notch product. They have unmatched quality as far as like everything that goes. I mean, they, they really do their work to make sure that everything that is in that bottle is what they say is on the label, even though they're in a field that is unregulated by the FDA. Uh, again, they have a strict 
uh, quality standard. And again, CBD has a ton of cool benefits for people. Um, again, you can look up, just do a search on benefits of CBD or anecdotal evidence from CBD because again, there's so many people that are using it and they've gotten so many cool benefits from it. My encouragement with people always is again, just to try it for yourself. Don't take my word from it. Don't take anybody's word from it. Like try it out yourself and see what you feel. Again, I like the product. I think it's great. I use it uh, once a day. Then I get a bunch of benefits from it. So again, if you'd like to try out any other stuff, you can go to charlottesweb.com. Promo code is jujitsu20 for 20% off the order. And uh, you can give it a try for yourself. Get a one-month supply of a tincture or a pack of gummies. And then uh, play around with the dosage. Play around with the timing, both day, night, afternoon. Kind of see what seems to be uh, best for you and go from there. Also, thanks to our sponsor, Epic Roll. If you guys have never been to their website at epicrollbjj.com, I encourage you I, I'm encourage you to give you a little gentle nudge to go check it out. On their website, they have tons of really cool jiu-jitsu gear and merchandise. They've got everything from t-shirts and rash guards and shorts and geese and everything else in between. And again, it has really cool designs that are handmade from the owner matt who's our sponsor he makes all the designs himself puts a lot of work into it i think the designs look cool the products themselves are high quality and you'll enjoy wearing them and they're comfortable too like the the shirts and the shorts and the geese everything is really comfortable and uh, so again i encourage you to check them out every time i've met someone i always like to ask people because again this is my my way of checking quality a little bit i'll like talk to someone if i see them at one of my seminars or if they come to uh one of my or come to the gym and to one of my classes and I see him wearing Epic Roll stuff. I'll say, Hey, where did you find that from? Or how did you hear about Epic Roll? And a lot of times it's from Eugene and I will say, Hey, like I heard it on the podcast. I'm like, cool. How do you like their stuff? I've never had one person say, I hate their stuff. I was unsatisfied with the product. It's always been a positive experience with them. And so again, Check them out at epicrollbjj.com. And if you like something and you'd like to save 15% off, use the promo code Chujitsu and you'll save 15% off your order. Also, thanks to Manscaped, the premier men's grooming company. If you guys want to check them out, again, they make everything that a man could possibly need for all their grooming like desires, right? Whether you need something to trim your beard or your balls, whether you need to clean yourself up, smell nice for your, your woman or your man, whatever, like they've got you covered. And again, I've used almost all of their products. I like them all. I think I'm wearing their underwear right now. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, it's like, you know, they make good stuff. And again, everything comes in pre uh, premium packaging. The products are premium. The trimmer itself, the one that they push a lot of times is a great trimmer. I use it on my beard. I use it all over my body. Like whenever my wife has to like trim my, because I, I, for me, I, I'm one of those guys where I don't have like carpet back or anything like that, but I do get enough hair where like I look ridiculous because yeah. my barber will, he'll give me that like, He'll give me that crew, the crew neck um, thing. And my, I feel like it looks ridiculous. And so my, my wife will give me a little trim every now and then. She'll shear me, as she says. And uh, again, it's a great trimmer. It's waterproof, you know, and it's uh, it's got it. In, here's the thing, actually, that I was actually most impressed with. It's got a crazy long battery life. Like, yeah, it does. Yeah, bro. I like that. That one that like, they gave us to it. They, the one that they gave us originally. I don't think I charged that thing for. I, and again, I, I can't tell you how many hours I used it. But like I didn't charge it for like it had to be like six months and I would use it to trim my beard, use it to trim whatever. And then like I remember it was like six months later, we finally had to put it back on the charger. I was like, that's pretty impressive. That's a long time for a battery life. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, that's helpful for to, to me because I used to have a, a regular corded trimmer and the corded trimmer was great. But the problem was, is like I couldn't like I like to like because again there's hair everywhere with the beard and stuff. I like to go sit in the bathtub so I can trim it up and then like I can collect the hair up instead of my hair just being sp sp like spewing about all over the the bathroom, right? For all mm -hmm. any guy any guy that has a beard has to trim their beard or has to trim anything, you know what I'm talking about. Like your your wife if if you have one or your husband or whomever, if you live with someone, they probably love when you trim your beard and you've got hair just all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I can sit in the bathtub and I can have a mirror right there and just trim it. It collects down at the bottom. I collect it with a paper towel, throw it away. There you go. Um, and again, because it's cordless and it's waterproof and it's all those cool things. And so anyway, I'm talking about the product. If you guys would like to check out any of their stuff on their website, get yourself some good men's grooming products, check them out. Um, for a guy out there, get, give yourself a little reward and step up your grooming game. You can go to manscaped.com. The promo code is jujitsu20. That'll save 20% off the order and give you free shipping at checkout. It's a pretty good deal. 
And guys, if you want to support the podcast directly, you can do so by going to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Jiu Jitsu podcast. When you join, you'll get access to all the exclusive content that we make for the podcast. Lots of podcast extras, never before seen interviews and little chats with Eugene and I. There's segments from each one of our guests that we've had on the podcast, giving you some sort of idea or tip for your actual Jiu Jitsu training. And on top of that, when you join, you'll get two free gifts. One is a 20 minute warm up slash stretching routine that Eugene made specifically for Jiu Jitsu people. Really great stuff if you want to sort of step up your game as far as being more mobile, being a little bit more flexible, and maybe not being so stiff in your hips and low back and shoulders and all that stuff. Great stuff for that. And then there's also a seminar that I did that is Gi and No Gi both, which can give you a lot of cool like looks at different changes and variations from Gi to No Gi with the grips, uh, and also show you some of my best techniques everything from one of my best escapes down to some of my best guard passing to back takes and if you guys want to see both of those bonuses plus all the exclusive content that we've already uploaded for the last couple of years you can get it at the patreon at patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast and uh, guys last but not least if you would like to join my chew crew email list to get my daily email you can do so by going to jujitsu.net slash join j-o-i-n by joining you'll get access to three free ebooks that i give away to the new members and then upon that you'll get my daily email which i send out typically monday through friday sometimes in the weekend which will give you actionable tips on your training give you some ideas to think about um and in some cases i'll give you special deals and offers i don't offer anywhere else so you can check that out and uh guys with that said thank you so much for joining us today i hope you're doing well and we'll talk to you next week mm -hmm.